the physiological state of the patient uh, might actually deteriorate suddenly. And that's when clinicians need to take swift action to save the patient. This could be a sudden heart attack. It could be a problem breathing. It could be um, uh, simply the heart stopped beating. In those cases, the clinicians um, have to take swift action um, to save the patient. Some of these events occur suddenly without much um, prior indication that the patient is actually doing worse. Uh, sometimes you actually do have an indication you know, from the measured signals that the patient is, um, is slowly deteriorating. But the general paradigm right now is that the crisis actually happens and then the clinician responds. I mean, although the clinicians actually do their best to avert the crisis in the first place, uh, sometimes they can't do so. The crisis happens and the, patient, the, the clinicians actually rush to the patient's bedside and try their best to save the patient. This, I would call a reactive patient care paradigm, is that you actually react to something going wrong with the patient. Um, and you react very forcefully and very swiftly, and therefore you can actually save the patient. We're collecting a lot of data in critical care units. And the question can naturally be asked is, with all of this data available, could we actually predict which patient might be in imminent danger of having a deterioration of state, of the physiological state, or which patient is actually um, doing uh, well. And that would actually allow clinicians to intervene much earlier uh, and before the crisis actually happens. One of the central research questions in this field is, can we actually take all of this data that's being collected at the patient's bedside um, in real time and process it to give the clinician indication of what the state of the patient might be one hour, two hour, five hours, or six hours out. So we could actually move from a patient care paradigm that is reactive, one that's reacting to a crisis, to one that's actually predictive, where with um, a reasonable degree of certainty, we could actually tell the, pa uh, the, the clinician which patient is in imminent danger of physiologic decompensation or deterioration, and which patient might actually be stable and might um, be so for the next um, four, six, eight, ten hours. That would allow the clinician to actually intervene earlier in those patients who are at a greater risk of deterioration or simply to increase surveillance, to actually to keep a closer look on those patients who might be identified as being unstable or predicted um, to deteriorate. Uh, versus those who are actually um, quite stable and might not need uh, further surveillance uh, beyond what is already being provided. So this, uh, this kind of predictive patient care paradigm uh, is very attractive because we have access to all of the bedside monitoring data. We have access to um, computers that can actually um, do a large number of computations every second. And we can build large databases of patients who have been at the same hospital, maybe even cared for the same condition. So the time is actually right to ask this question of prediction in uh, intensive care or even in the regular hospital room. And so to provide um, clinicians with a possibility to intervene earlier, um, even an hour earlier, uh, or two hours earlier might actually be ma making a big difference uh, and might mean um, the difference between a patient actually being, uh, the clinicians actually being able to stabilize a patient or a patient having to be transferred from the regular hospital room to the intensive care unit. So the challenges here are um, to collect a large number of data and to learn from this data, uh, to actually look at a particular event, have a large database that has um, a sufficient number of events, whatever this event might be, uh, of deterioration events, and then to actually look backwards from these deterioration events and understand whether there are 
signatures in the multi-parameter data streams that we collect at the bedside um, of the patient and to see whether we can actually develop algorithms that identify these patterns and then um, de deploy these algorithms you know, at the bedside and to see whether uh, we can correctly identify patients uh, ahead of time that uh, might be at risk of, uh, of decompensation or deterioration. Obviously, we have to make sure that the algorithms and the alarms that we issue um, are very specific, meaning that we don't flag unnecessarily patients who are not at risk of deterioration. But that can actually be de uh, determined through an adequate um, design of experiments that uh, one would have to conduct in order to actually deploy these algorithms. The problems in this research area is uh, right now is really building large enough databases and rich enough databases of uh, patients who experience events um, in order to apply these kinds of machine learning algorithms. We're involved here at MIT with uh, developing a large uh, database of patients in, in critical care. It's called the MIMIC2 database. And the database, I think, now has about 50,000 patients, about five to 10,000 of which have high-resolution bedside monitoring uh, waveform data available. So one central challenge is to, see, uh, is to build a database on which you can actually train algorithms and on which you can actually test algorithms before you um, deploy these algorithms in a, uh, in a clinical environment. Another challenge is actually to identify patterns. Uh, patterns of disease progression or patterns that might precede uh, clinical deterioration uh, and to see whether these patterns are actually consistent, consistent across patients. If each patient has his or her own pattern, then it's very difficult for an algorithm to actually identify these patterns across large enough patient populations so that these algorithms might actually make a difference. So pattern um, identification is a big um, it's a big challenge to see whether there are actually consistent patterns across patients and to identify these pa patterns. Once we have these patterns identified, we can actually program computers to recognize them and uh, then these computers can actually be deployed in clinical settings and we can actually uh, evaluate their performance. But it's not a priori clear what these patterns might be. So there's a big step that actually has to do with identifying patterns um, um, of patient deterioration. And then we have to have access to a clinical environment where you can actually test your algorithms. And um, most often this is done in collaborating sites that are willing to actually put these algorithms uh, at the patient's bedside. And uh, first it's done in um, a silent mode, which means that the alarm or that's being issued is not shown to the clinician. It's just to evaluate the algorithm and to see whether the algorithm actually identifies um, the correct patients and does not identify those patients who might not have um, the disease or who might not be at risk of, de of uh, physiological decompensation. Obviously there will always be some false positives and there will always be some false negatives. That means there will always be some patients that you incorrectly flag um, as um, being at risk of deterioration and then there are some patients that might deteriorate who you didn't flag. And it's exactly these kinds of performance metrics that need to be uh, identified, uh, specified, and uh, evaluated in order to uh, figure out whether a particular algorithm is a valid clinical tool that you know, should be deployed in a clinical setting. So looking forward you know, over the next 10 or 20 years, um, the trend is to more and more measurements more and more signals that uh, can be obtained less and less invasively from not only patients who are in specialized environments like the critical care unit or the operating room, but there's a big area uh, of wearable monitors, um, wearable devices that can monitor your, your physiologic state. So the, the big prospect over the next 10 or 20 years is to actually take all of these measurements and to uh, develop algorithms that allow us to quantify the state of your health and to allow us not only to quantify the state of the health but also to allow us to predict what might actually be happening to your uh, physiological systems ahead of time.
so that we can intervene or that clinicians can intervene uh, before a major health crisis actually takes place. And that is really the, I think that is really one of the big opportunities of all of the data that's currently being collected in hospital environments and that we start to collect from patients uh, or, you know, even healthy subjects, healthy people, you know, through wearable, wearable monitoring technology to use all of this data to actually define the health of the patient and to predict what might actually um, happening to the patient over the next few hours. <music>